John Barlow was convicted in 1995 of killing Wellington businessman Eugene Thomas and his son Jean. Despite some crucial evidence being discredited, a second attempt to appeal his conviction has been rejected by the Governor-General. Barlow's lawyer now plans to apply to the Privy Council to have his client's case heard. As well as that, Barlow's first parole hearing comes up later this year. Today, we go inside the courtroom to capture the drama of the trial that convicted him, giving the full background to this shocking case. There's no direct evidence of who shot the two Thomases. John Robert Barlow believed he could get away with murder. The key features, the gun, the silencer and the ammunition. Jim Thomas is laying, the poyer is full of blood. The first shot has not killed his victim. Survival time would be measured in seconds to a few minutes at the most. The right middle finger of the accused, John Robert Barlow. On February 16, 1994, in the boardroom of Wellington Finance Company Thomas & Thomas, Eugene Thomas, 68, a self-made millionaire moneylender, and his 30-year-old son, Jean, both had a final appointment. In cold-blooded murder, they were gunned down in an assassination-style crime that would stun the country. In Thomas Senior's diary, the last appointment of the day was with a John Barlow, an old acquaintance of Thomas Senior. My name was, was obviously leaked. Delivered. Days later, a Karori businessman volunteered to the media that he was not the killer. It never registered that I would be accused of it because I hadn't done it. It was this 49-year-old company director and firearms collector who was to stand trial three times for the double murder of Eugene and Jean Thomas. This was a trial based entirely on circumstantial evidence. The Crown had two missing links in their case. One, there were no eyewitnesses, and two, they were never able to fully establish a clear motive. They would have to rely on logical inferences based on proved facts. It was a classic who done it. This is the story of John Barlow's first trial. John Robert Barlow, you are charged that on the 16th day of February 1994 at Wellington, you did murder Eugene Nugent Thomas and you are further charged that on the 16th day of February 1994 at Wellington, you did murder Jean Alexander Thomas. How say you, Barlow? Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Your Honour, I appear to let it bring Ms. Cull to the accused. John Barlow's lawyer, John Billington, was tackling his 11th and most high profile defended murder charge, assisted by Helen Cull. May it please Your Honour, I appear with my learned friend, Mr. Mander, for the Crown. For Crown Prosecutor Ken Stone, this would be about the 30th time he'd led the police's case in a murder trial. He would be assisted by Cameron Mander. Ladies and gentlemen... Presiding over the trial would be Justice Naser. Hills. From a jury pool of 150, seven women and five men, predominantly blue-collar, swore to do their duty in what would be a complicated and highly technical four-week trial. Justice Naser ruled that cameras were not allowed to film the jury or the public gallery during the entire trial. The Crown started its case with the prosecutor's opening address, which in part introduced the 94 witnesses to be called by the prosecution. <coughs> Your Honour pleases, Mr Foreman and members of the jury. This was a cold-blooded killing of two men seated in their own office here in this city, early in the evening of a summer's day. This was a very extensive, a very complex investigation carried out by a large number of police and by forensic scientists. All kinds of inquiries made, leading in all sorts of directions, but all of them pointing more and more towards this accused and nobody else. The all-important issue, the vital issue which runs, runs through the whole case, is whether at the end of the trial, and having regard to the whole of the evidence, assessed in a common sense way, you were satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that it was the accused John Robert Barlow 
who murdered the Thomases. And the Crown says to you, the evidence you are about to hear overwhelmingly shows that to be the case. Robert Pleasers. Thank you, Mr. Stein. The prosecution's case was that John Barlow had pulled from his briefcase a Czechoslovakian CZ-27 pistol that was attached to a 330 millimeter long silencer. He then shot to kill using a rear gecko ammunition. Wait, it was this cleaner who saw the dead body of Jean Thomas, but before that, he had witnessed a man matching John Barlow's description the right leaving the Thomas right building at 6.35pm. Yes, yes. Then, as the cleaner made his way up in the lift, he was to see a body on the third floor. I, I looking the glass of the door, is uh, Jean Thomas is laying, the foyer is full of blood, nose and mouth in the flooring. In the kitchen of the minor blood spots. Detective Mercado's evidence was that it was more than an hour before police realised that they were dealing with a double homicide after they discovered Thomas Senior's body in the boardroom. Each time we moved between Mr Thomas Junior and Mr Thomas Senior, we had to take precautions to prevent uh, what we call cross-contamination, moving uh, blood or, or other forensic exhibits from one area of the scene to another. So the blood in the scene was, was drying very rapidly and I wanted to have those uh, scientists that specialise in interpreting blood splatters uh, and blood patterns into the scene that evening so they could see it whilst the blood was still relatively fresh. It was on uh, the boardroom table we had located this uh, uh, bullet. I could not locate any cartridge cases. Was that the only bullet that was located at the scene as distinct from what might have been in the bodies? Yes, apart from the ones in the bodies, that was the only bullet. It was time for the court to go to town. Justice Naser, the lawyers and the jury would visit the murder scene, the officers of Invincible Life and Thomas and Thomas. This was a familiarisation exercise to help the jury to understand the layout of the officers and to visualise the murder scenario that the prosecution was about to put forward. Back in court, the prosecution then introduced a new tool, computer-generated images called photogrammetry, which showed the office drawn to scale and where the bodies were found. It was the prosecution's case that Barlow had withdrawn his pistol and silencer as the three sat around the board table. He had then stood and first shot Thomas Senior at point-blank range, as described by the pathologist, Dr Kenneth Thompson. The entry wound was about here. On the right side. On the right side. A bullet going across through the facial structures to end there in fact, fractured the base of the skull on the right. Um, it went through the jaw and through a lot of the sinus bones inside the nose. The first shot, uh, shall we call it, to Mr. Thomas Senior entered his right temple and we believe he's then fallen forward onto the table and it's quite possible that having just been shot in the, in, in the head at very close range that he was stunned or knocked out by that shot. The Crown's evidence was that Barlow then turned to Jean Thomas Jr and fired at his throat as he tried to flee backwards. What we positively know is that that shot has passed through the hand of Mr Thomas Jr and a bruise that was located on his, on his the, the tie line of uh, the tie, uh, necktie area of his throat suggests that his hand was, was raised to protect his face. Barlow pursued Thomas Jr and shot him for the second and final time. After that second shot has been fired and, and entered uh, Mr Thomas Jr's right hand nostril and straight into his head and, and and around his brain, he is then staggered with his bleeding hand, tipped over onto his back. 
by the uh, main entrance where we found him. What would be the effect of such an injury? This is a fatal injury. Survival time would be measured in seconds to a few minutes at the most. The prosecution's evidence was that Barlow then moved into Thomas Senior's office to rip the pages out of the desk diary that identified Barlow as having the last appointment. Pages removed from it. It jumps from the uh, 2nd of February through to the 17th of February, which is today. However, other diaries in the office would highlight the Karori businessman's name.